you know, when I was talking to Sonny yesterday, he asked me, when did you become interested in World War II? And I told him when I was eight years old. And immediately I knew that was a mistake because I figured if he said that in front of a crowd like this, they would immediately think, oh, I'll bet he had a normal childhood. <laughs> world War II was the greatest conflict the world has ever seen. It ended more than 71 years ago with a peace surrender on the deck of the battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay. You would think that now that we're in the 21st century, everything possible would have been written about World War II. But no, I guarantee you there's still plenty of history to write, there's still plenty of stories to be told. Here's one I'll bet you haven't heard. My stepmother was an Englishwoman from a Royal Navy family. Her stepfather, bear with me here, was a lieutenant in the Royal Navy in 1940. He told me the story of once of how he was in the destroyer Hero in a battle in a Norwegian fjord. Now there were explosions, torpedoes, shells, and it was a bad day for the fish in the fjord. Apparently, Lieutenant Alcock didn't have enough to do. So during the battle, he spent his time fishing these poor fish out of the water. And I thought, okay, well that's a different story. I don't think that ended up in the captain's report of the battle. If it had, it might have gone like this. May it please their lordships, in this action my ship sank two German destroyers and oh yes, Lieutenant Alcock collected 47 fish. <laughs> it's not how it went. Here's another story that I bet you haven't heard before that's begging to be completed. In 1942, an American naval task force was making its way across the North Atlantic to join the British. It was led by Admiral Billy Wilcox. The weather was awful, high seas, wind, and rain. One day, when they were in the middle of the North Atlantic, Admiral Wilcox was seen on the quarter deck of his flagship, the battleship Washington, alone. A few minutes later, a sailor called out, man overboard, but the weather was so bad, the man couldn't be saved. Well, it turned out, the man overboard was Admiral Wilcox. It also happened that in his cabin, his suitcase was packed. Now, people had a lot of theories, but nobody saw what happened to him. I've learned that in an archive somewhere, there's a file on Admiral Wilcox that's closed until the year 2018. Maybe then we'll find out what really happened to him, and that story will be completed. Now, there's more to the history of World War II than just stories like these. But stories like these can teach us so much. A few years ago, at the Pacific War Museum in Fredericksburg, I listened to Marine Corporal Herschel Williams tell his story. He was at the Battle of Iwo Jima, the one where photographer Joe Rosenthal captured the famous flag raising. Corporal Williams was given a flamethrower and he was ordered to take out Japanese pillboxes. And that is what he did with the help of Marine riflemen who were assigned to protect him. At one point, Japanese soldiers charged him with their bayonets, but he fought them off. He won the Medal of Honor for this. But what I remember most about Corporal Williams is that he took no credit. He gave all the credit to the Marine riflemen who protected him, especially the four who were killed doing it. From Corporal Williams, we learn what it took to defeat the Japanese in World War II, and we learn about courage and humility. World War II created an entire generation of veterans with stories that we can learn from. It's the job of historians to tell those stories and to tell the history of the war. Not to glorify war, hopefully, not to glorify that war, but to learn from it and maybe to humanize it. 
Now, there's no time limit on writing history, but the people who made history, the people who fought the war, can't live forever. And we're rapidly losing the veterans of the World War II generation. To me, this becomes very real when I pick up the phone and I call up one of the veterans I know who's still alive. This, by the way, is Corporal Williams. This, by the way, is a ship called HMS Eagle. This ship was the one a friend of mine named Fred Davenport was in. I called him up a few days ago and hoped that he would answer the phone. Fred had told me the story about how his ship was hit by four U-boat torpedoes and sank in five minutes. If Fred had been in his usual battle station in an ammunition magazine down below, he wouldn't have gotten out. But thankfully, he did. Thankfully, he answered the phone when I called. But Fred is 95. All of the World War II veterans I know are in their 90s, except for one, a Marine named Ron Van Stockham, who just turned 100. Now, these veterans are, are priceless. We're lucky to have them, but they're not going to live forever. But maybe all is not lost. If we talk to the veterans we now have, we record what they say, and if we look for things that the veterans who are no longer with us left behind, like memoirs, diaries, letters, photographs, those things are treasures that historians can use to tell stories. Sometimes the treasure is in the form of a letter. For instance, on the battleship Washington, an officer was censoring a letter that a sailor was writing to his mother back home. And the letter went something like this. Dear Mom, if you knew where we was and what we was a-going to do, you'd shit yourself. <laughs> Love, Jake. The officer who censored this letter said he knew exactly how Jake felt. And that officer happened to have a famous name. It was Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., who spent the entire war in the US Navy. Sometimes the treasure can come in the form of a memoir. Lieutenant Alastair Robertson was the navigating officer of this ship, HMS Abdeel. His daughter, Catherine, is the keeper of his private memoir of the war. In the memoir, he tells a story about how one evening he was on the bridge of the ship talking to a signalman, when the signalman suddenly blurted out, Do you see them porpoises over there? Well, all eyes looked over in that direction, but what they saw was not porpoises. They were the tracks of torpedoes heading straight for the ship. To avoid them, the captain ordered, hard to port! But to Lieutenant Robertson, the ship took an unconscionable amount of time to turn. Well, she finally did, just in time and those porpoises missed the ship by 30 feet. Now, sometimes the treasure is something that a veteran used in the war. Canadian Spitfire pilot Jerry Smith left behind a logbook and a diary, and those are kept by his younger sister, Wendy. In 1942, Smith flew a Spitfire off the American aircraft carrier Wasp, bound for the island of Malta. After he took off, his gas tank didn't work properly, and he decided to land back on board the aircraft carrier. Problem was, no one had ever landed a Spitfire on an aircraft carrier before. There was a good reason for that, because the Spitfire didn't have a hook to catch one of the wires along the flight deck to stop it. Much of the crew of the Wasp was watching breathlessly 
as this story unfolded. The first time Smith came in for a landing, he was waved off. He was coming in too high, too fast. He came around again. This time, he landed on the flight deck and he started to break. Nobody thought he was going to make it, except maybe him. But he did. He stopped his plane just short of the bow with six feet to spare. The crew went wild. He went down below decks. Remember, this is a dry ship. Somebody slipped him a whiskey. <laughs> Smith eventually made it to Malta. He shot down some German airplanes flying a Spitfire off Malta. But a few months later, he went missing in action, chasing a German bomber out to sea. Thanks to Smith's sister, Wendy, I can tell you his story. Thanks to Lieutenant Robertson's daughter, Catherine, I can tell you his story. Thanks to the families of veterans, we can continue telling stories from World War II. And that is where you can come in. This is where you can help. If you still have a veteran in your family, talk to the veteran. See if he or she is willing to talk. Maybe they're not as reticent as they were before. And record what they have to say. If your family had a veteran from World War II, then see if they left behind something that can help tell their story of the war in a big way or a small way. With help from people like you, historians can continue telling the history of the war well into the 21st century. Historians are not done with World War II, and I hope you're not either. Now, believe it or not, there's more to history than World War II. <laughs> there's history all around us. We're here today by the San Antonio River at the Witte Museum, which tells the story of San Antonio and South Texas. See if your family has something that can help tell that story. I'd like to dedicate this to two veterans. First, my father, up here, who was a lieutenant in the United States Army in World War II. He was wounded in the Battle of Anzio in 1944, and believe me, he had the scars to prove it. Also to a man I never met, a Marine named Mike Flynn. Mike Flynn was my mother's college sweetheart at the University of Texas during the war. He went off to war, and he was killed in the Battle of Okinawa just three days before the end of the war. And I've been hearing about him most of my life. May we never forget our veterans, and long may we tell their stories. Thank you. <laughs>